This video is brought to you by Devout Decals, makers of reusable Catholic art for your home altar, your bedroom, and your home classroom. Blessed Sunday, we have a return to our coverage here of the dreams of St. John Bosco. And some of these are not actually dreams. Some of these are the accounts from biographical memoirs. Some his own writings, uh, but in that collection it's often what others, the accounts of others, eyewitnesses to things that he did. St. John Bosco ran an orphanage for boys, a very famous one in the 19th century, and he was concerned first and foremost with the salvation of their souls. Yes, these relatively young men who you would think many still retained their innocence, but did not because they had passed the age of reason. And here we, in the first vision, we hear him talk about the need to go to confession. And what he and an account of his ability to you know on occasion be given the grace to read souls which sounds incredible but there are numerous saints in history usually confessors who could do so padre pio being the most famous in the 20th century i advise you to carefully listen to him when he talks about the need to go to confession he has a very it's an interesting dream or vision he had that really shows the state of the soul as if present at a banquet and what the soul depending on its state of grace is and what it how and what it feasts on at this feast the 14 tables a vision of saint john bosco i saw my boys in a most gorgeous garden seated as 14 long tables arranged amphitheater wise at three different terrace like levels the topmost tables were so lofty that they could hardly be seen at the very bottom, a certain number of boys were seated at a table, which was bare except for bits of rancid, moldy bread mixed with garbage and husks. These poor boys looked like swine at their trough. I meant to tell them to throw that rubbish away, but instead I just asked them why they were served such a loathsome refuse. They replied, We have to eat the bread we have provided for ourselves. It's all we have. This table symbolized the state of mortal sin. As Holy Scripture states, they hated knowledge and chose not the fear of the Lord. They ignored my counsel. They spurned all my reproof. Now they eat the fruit of their own way, and with their own device be glutted. As for the table set on higher levels, the boys seated at them looked happier and ate better bread. They were very handsome, with comeliness and radiance constantly increasing. Their tables, too, were richly set with special linen, glittering candelabra, sparkling chinaware, and indescribable gorgeous flowers. The platters held delicious foods and rare delicacies. The number of these boys was very great. These tables symbolized the state of repentant sinners. Lastly, the tables at the top had a sort of bread I cannot describe. It looked gold and red, as did the boys' garments and faces, which shone with brilliant light. All these boys looked radiantly happy. Each one tried to share his joy with the others. Their comeliness and the glitter and splendor of their tables far surpassed all the others. These tables symbolized the state of those who had retained their baptismal innocence. As Holy Scripture says of the innocent and of the repentant sinner, He who obeys me dwells in security, in peace without fear of harm. The most surprising aspect of this dream is that I knew each of the boys, so that as I see one of them now, I immediately see, seem to see him seated at one of those tables. As I was entranced by that exceptional sight, I noticed a man some distance away. I ran to him to ask him questions, but I tripped on the way and awoke in my bed. You asked me to tell you a dream, and I obliged. Give it no more importance than dreams deserves. Here's a note here from the publication. The following day, Don Bosco told each boy privately at which table he was seated in the dream. To show them how high or low they stood, he graded them from the topmost table to the lowest. Asked if one could move from a lower table to a higher table, he replied in the affirmative, except the topmost table. Those who fell from that could not return, because that table was exclusively for those who kept their baptismal innocence. Their number was small, whereas very many boys sat at the other tables. A Little Marmot An excerpt from a biography and his memoirs from St. John Bosco. Don Bosco used to give a short talk to the community after night prayers, concluding always with the greeting of good night. This tradition continues in Salesian schools, and the talk is called The Good Night. Here is the summary of one of the many good nights recorded in the volumes of the biographical memoirs. 
One of the first good nights I heard from Don Bosco in 1859 was on the frequent reception of the sacraments, a practice not yet generally taken up by the boys after their recent summer vacations. He narrated a dream in which he seemed to be standing near the oratory main entrance while the boys returned from home. As they walked past him, he could see the state of their souls before God. A stranger also walked in with them, holding a small box. The stranger mingled with the boys, and when the time came for confessions, he opened the box and, taking out a little marmot, started to give a puppet show of sorts. Rather than go to the church, the boys crowded around him to enjoy the fun, while he slowly withdrew into a corner of the playground farthest from the church. Then, without naming anyone, Don Bosco proceeded to describe the spiritual condition of many boys. He also spoke of the devil's efforts and snares to distract and discourage them from confession. His portrayal of the little marmot's tricks provoked many laughs, but it also made the boys reflect seriously on their spiritual condition, all the more so when later he told private inquirers things they thought nobody could ever knew. Th this dream was instrumental in inducing most of the boys to go to confession much more frequently, generally once a week. Naturally, reception of Holy Communion became very frequent as well. I also remember that once, as Don Bosco was talking of bodily health and of the important need of caring for it, the cleric Joseph Bongiovanni asked permission to speak. On being given leave, he said, What are we to do, then, to go enjoy good life and live a long life? Don Bosco replied, I will give you a secret, or rather a prescription. While serving as a reply to the cleric Bongiovanni, it will also greatly benefit you all. To enjoy good health and live a long life, you need four things. 1. A clear conscience when you go to bed at night. That is, no fear of eternity. 2. Moderation in eating. 3. An active life. 4. Good companions, that is, fleeing from those who are corrupt. He then briefly explained these four points. As we can see, Don Bosco's good nights wisely governed the oratory. One may read in that same chapter some examples of Don Bosco's kind firmness. A Fierce Dog An excerpt from the biographical memoirs of Don Bosco Father Rufino narrates in the Chronicle of April 1864, At this time there was a boy at the oratory named P, his name is redacted, who would have nothing to do with sacraments or prayers. He was there by force. One day Don Bosco took him aside. Why is it there is always a fierce dog snarling and snapping at you? He asked him. I don't see any dog. I do. Tell me, how does your conscience feel? The boy hung his head. Take heart, Don Bosco said. Come with me, and everything will be all right. The youngster became Don Bosco's friend and is now determined to do good. At the spiritual retreat's close on the evening of April 13th, Don Bosco expressed his regret that some boys had not used it for the good of their souls. During these few days, he said, I saw all the sins of each of you clearly, as if they were written in front of me. There was some confusion only when a few, in making their general confession, tried to tell me their sins instead of answering my questions. This was a singular grace the Lord gave me during these few days for your own good. Now, most probably, the few who did not follow my advice will ask me whether I can still read their conscience, and the answer, unfortunately, is no. They have lost their chance. And there it is. The dreams and accounts of others of St. John Bosco and his interventions in the lives of these young men to try to keep them on the path of righteousness it seems to me, at least, that there is a distinct lack of these kind of priests. And I know there are, you know, good priests deeply concerned with confession. Don't mistake in what I'm saying. It just seems that in past ages, including just a few decades ago, there were priests who were famous as confessors for their saintly ability to read souls. And there doesn't really seem to be that anymore. I wonder what happened. I wonder what changed. I wonder what caused that. Perhaps it's just a sign of the times. I'm not sure what to think of that, honestly. Perhaps I'm just too much of a pessimist. I don't know. Let me know what you thought of this the, this collection of visions and uh, accounts of St. John Bosco from others in the comments, please. And hopefully it'll inspire you to go to confession if you need to. Like and subscribe if you haven't. It does help, as does sharing this on social media. That helps a lot, too. As always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.